some amazing data was released recently. You can uh, read about uh, the information in a recent uh, uh, blog post I wrote, but it, it comes down to something that is very simple. And it is this 82, no, 92% of all churches in the United States have an attendance under 250, 92 we know the median's around 65. We know that there are a lot of small churches, but hear that well. 92% of churches have an attendance under 250. And of course, many of them well below 200, even below 100. The reason I'm saying that is usually there's an attitude as we get towards smaller churches. Uh, oh, they're just small churches. And it's almost a kind of sending attitude. Um, and some, sometimes we don't work with these small churches or work alongside them because we say eh, it's a helpless situation or a hopeless situation. That absolutely is not true. And Mark Clifton and I are going to talk about the rise of the small church. I really think it's happening. I've got a lot of reasons for that. They're, they're not just based upon hope and, and thinking that this might happen. I think we're going to see a great movement. And I can tell you what Mark Clifton is already at the forefront of this movement. He's even going to be more so. Mark, I love talking about these small churches. I would call it not the rise of the small church. I would call it mm -hmm. the return of the small church. Um, okay. Well, you know what we'll do? We're, we, we, will, we will just put the rise and return of the small churches like that. Because I'm, I am convinced, Tom, that the small church has been the norm throughout all of Christian history. And if we're just going to talk about North American history, it's been the norm in North American history. Yes. Um, the large churches, we count large churches, you know, 500 to 1,000, 2,000 people. That is a recent, I mean, that is a very recent development. I want you to think with me, um, when you and I first started ministry, how many really large super mega churches there were. Uh, just a handful, you know, yep, you, can you can probably name him. You can name him by name. First Baptist Dallas was probably there and a few others in Southern Baptist life, even in, in non-Southern Baptist life. There just weren't very many. And in fact, yep. when I was teaching at Midwestern one time seminary, um, I had a student who did a kind of a word search thing and I, I wish I'd have kept it, but he, he looked at the frequency of the term small church and it really began to be used in, in uh, writing very much in the 1960s and 70s. And before that, it wasn't used very often. Because it was um, a normal church. It was just a church. They just called it a church. So you didn't even yeah. identify it. a church of 100 was not a small church. It was a church. But later, as, as, church, as, as, as the church growth movement, we've talked about it before, as it came into being, as, as mega churches came into being, you know, in the 1950s and 60s, we had Lyle, we had not Lyle Shaw, we had Robert Schuler out in California, right? And his big thing that, you Rejoice know, and be glad. Movie. This is the day yes. the Lord has made. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, seriously, though, it's like, wow, you can actually grow a church big, you know, and then, of course, all the others done it. And and that became sort of the model of, of really. And, in, and even on the other end of the spectrum and the other end of the country, you had uh, Jerry Falwell at uh, Thomas Road. So, you know, along in, in the 50s and 60s, you begin to see the, this movement of really, really large churches and technology increased. You had better microphone systems. You could have better sound systems in large places. And you begin to have some video screens even and things like that. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, we got all these small churches now. No, we don't have all these small churches now. These are just churches. They've always been here, you know? And when you say that all these small churches, like, oh man, they need to get big. By, by calling them small, man, there's something wrong with them. You know, they're not, they're not as good as the big churches because if they were as good as the big churches, they would be big too. And that's just so jacked up in so many ways. But how, how do you feel about this, Mark? Come on now. <laughs> Can you can you can you give me a little emotion? I feel like this is just so dry that you don't care about it at all. I heard, and I, I maybe you you're the statistician. Maybe you can help me with this because I've been saying this for years. Hope it's true. <laughs> we'll make it true one way or another, Mark. I heard. I saw it in writing uh, that there are more mega churches in Nashville, Tennessee today than there were in all of North America when I graduated from high school in 1978. That's I don't know true. that factually, but I would say anecdotally, it sounds true. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does sound. There true. weren't very many mega churches in 1978. There weren't very many churches over 2000 in 1978. Southern Baptist churches, I'm talking about across North America. 
And the mega right. church, the, the mega church that I remember very clearly because I, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky for 18 years was Southeast Christian Church. And right. it was a mega church early on. And then, of course, then it went past 10,000, past 15, past 20. Right. But uh, that was another one of those churches coming out of the independent Christian movement. OK, let's talk about the rise of the small church. Let's talk about the return of the small church. Let's don't call them the small church. Let's just say here, churches, whatever we want to do. But here's one of the first things we want to talk about. It's what I call the micro business revolution. Now, Tom, what does that have to do with churches? What is what, what, what are you talking about when you understand the micro business revolution? Well, here's what is happened. Small businesses got a bad rap for a season. Oh, it's only the big ones. It's the back and then it was the IBMs. It was the GEs. All those, those, those multinational businesses, those, those were the only ones that counted. And someone said, you know what? The smaller businesses, micro, sometimes only one employee, the owner, these micro businesses are actually the backbone of most countries' economic growth and development. My point on this, Mark, is these churches that, yeah, we put the what seems as the condescending adjective smaller in front of them, but these churches that aren't as big as mega churches, they're the backbone of Christian life, of, of even culture across North America and across the world. Absolutely. And the, the real uh, the real uh, influence that the church could have in a very broken and hurtful world isn't the small number of large churches. <laughs> it's the large number of smaller churches. Yes. Uh, you know, I've got a very famous uh, uh, PowerPoint. I don't use PowerPoint anymore. It's so it's so last decade, but when I used to use PowerPoint, I, got, You're so I cool, really don't Mark. Use it. I know it. Uh, I used to, I had a PowerPoint slide that people talk about a lot, um, and it, it was a it was a Air France jumbo jet on and on one side of it, and the other side was Kansas City Royals baseball stadium during the World Series. And for our our denomination, Southern Baptist, you could take every pastor who preached to more than fifteen hundred last weekend, you could put them on all on one Air France jumbo jet about 510 of them, all right? You take every pastor who preached to less than 250 last Sunday morning, and it would fill every seat in Royal Stadium, and there'd be standing room only. Mm -hmm. And you say, the adversary looks at that. Right, right. The adversary looks at that, and he realizes the real power of influence in North America are those 42,000 Southern Baptist churches that have less than 250, because they're in every county, in every community, in every crossroads, in every city, in every neighborhood, that is it's like there are more. And I'm talking about our, our group now, Southern Baptist. There are more Southern Baptist churches than there are Starbucks. There are more Southern Baptist churches than our McDonald's. People mm-hmm. don't look at a Starbucks and say, well, that's a little tiny coffee shop. They say, well, there's a Starbucks. There's a Starbucks. There's a Starbucks. The, the idea is we have so many. If they were truly disciple making, community transforming places, it would have an impact on our culture. But because we call them small, because they're trying to be copies of a big church, because they can't do the things the big church does, because their members have expectations that we ought to have everything the big church has, they feel like they've failed. And um, and so I just I'll leave it at that. We I, I, this is your podcast. So I don't want to take it over. So. <laughs> It's it's our pike, that's Mark. We we want to talk about attitudinal issues in this one. And and we're we're going to do two parts on the rise of the small church. We're going to do part one, this one, attitudinal issues, and then we're going to do part two, action issues, things are going. So let's let's talk about some of the attitudes. We we've addressed this. But resist the attitude of smaller is inferior. You did that perfectly with your metaphor, no, with your analogy of Starbucks of McDonald's. We don't compare churches yeah. to that, but the point is still the same. They're they're in the yeah. communities because they're needed in the communities for food. Well, guess what? These smaller churches are needed in the communities for spiritual food, and they yes, they, we shouldn't be talking about smaller in any type of inferior way. Mm-hmm. No, more accessible. They're more accessible. Uh, they're more local. Um, th- those kinds of things. They're more approachable. Those kinds of things. I mean, they have so many things going for them that they don't they don't run toward their strengths. They actually run away from their strengths and try to they run toward their weaknesses in many ways. And if, if smaller churches run toward their strengths, man, they are accessible. They are they are there. They are. Uh, oh, it's just they have so much that they can offer. You can you can 
you can give people leadership opportunities in a small church that you could never do initially in a church of 2000. There are ways that people in a small church can, can get involved and be trained up and become leaders in a small place. It's so much, in many ways, the, the, the track toward leadership is much quicker even than in a larger church. You and I have talked about the late Lyle Schaller on a number of occasions. We love the contributions he made. Lyle Schaller, however, was the person who coined the phrase rancher and shepherd regarding uh, church leaders. Peter Wagner picked it up, but it was it, it started with Lyle Schaller. And basically Lyle Schaller started, hey, we need more ranchers in the bigger church so the churches can become bigger. And we got away from the shepherd metaphor and maybe that was not one of his greatest contributions. I understand what he was trying to say. And I don't want to be too critical of a man who is 10 times smarter than I ever was. But maybe the idea that a pastor can be a shepherd is not a bad idea. It almost made the rancher the cool job to have. And the shepherd was what the rest of us had to do. You know, so Moses true. didn't want to be a shepherd out there and, you know, 40 years wandering around taking care of dumb sheep. You know, let me let me let me lead an army. Let me be a leader. Uh, it's almost as though when you really advance to the to the varsity team and you get to sit with the cool kids at the lunch table, you become a rancher. The rest of you are shepherds. Now, he wouldn't have said it that way, but that's he the way it began it. to come off. It yeah, really the, did. The next generation and, after Schaller I interpreted it that way. Yeah, and they devalued the, the idea of a shepherd and we want to be ranchers. I will tell you this, Dr. Rayner. I was in a eating establishment here in Kansas City. Uh, I think I told this story before, but whatever. I'm going to tell it again. I was in an eating establishment here in Kansas City some time ago, and a guy came in and sat behind me at the booth behind me without seeing who I was, but we knew each other, but he didn't notice me. And he was the pastor of a mega church in our city. Mm. And he was had some church planters with him. And I thought, well, this, I'll be, this is cool. I'm going to actually eavesdrop. I want to... <laughs> on this conversation because I was interested in why he was going to, he was going to, he was mentoring them. This was a mentoring deal. So he asked one of the church planters, he said, so, you know, your attendance now, he said about a hundred, 115. And he's beginning to talk to him about how he was dealing with his people. And he's, and, and he, he was making hospital visits and he was doing other things. And man, this mega church pastor said, brother, you got, you got to find ways to get away from that because he said, you know, you're going to scale this thing to the degree that you're not going to be able to give that kind of attentive service to every member and they're all going to expect it. So you have to find ways now to delegate that. And I just wanted to get off my table and walk over there and go, dude, don't listen to this old man. <laughs> if you got listen 115 people, man. if you got 115 people, be the shepherd to 115 people. All right. Don't don't. God may never want that church to be more than 115. He may want you to start 10 churches of 115. I mean, don't already begin to disengage yourself as a shepherd in anticipation that you're going to have to be a rancher. And it was like Ooh, that was the only model go. this mega let's church go. pastor behind me had was. And I thought, dude, there are like five mega churches in a city of two million. The chances <laughs> that this kid is going to pastor a church your size, which you didn't plant anyway, is absolutely and probably very highly unlikely. We need okay, you to have a little more emotion. We we need you to. It's it's getting again. It's getting dull and dry because you you just you 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 won't get into the flow of this, Mark. I, I want you to feel the moment. Okay, just feel All the right. moment. Hey, All this right. this whole idea of attitude of basing your worth and the worth of your church on the size of your church. That's been another issue that has happened when we start talking about the big churches versus the small churches, it becomes a matter of worth. I don't recall. It probably, it probably happened. Um, but I've been to, this is an unbelievable number. I've been to over 50 annual Southern Baptist convention meetings in my life. Um, I don't know. I started going when I was six, my parents took me, my dad was a pastor, but anyway, I don't ever recall any, I mean, they may have, but I don't recall any pastor preaching from the platform of the Southern Baptist Convention. In, in a, now, he may have spoken or something. I'm talking about being a featured preacher at the Southern Baptist Convention that was pastor of a church of 100 people. It's always, and usually he had his big choir behind him, and usually his choir was three times the size of any church I've ever pastored in my whole life, right? <laughs> and and it was like, it's like his choir came on three or four buses, you know, and it's like, I can't relate to that. I mean, that's good for him, but... You know, I got to go back. I'm preaching to 46 people Sunday morning. And, you know, I, I, I and that was 
92% of our churches. And so I, I just never really understood why we felt like the only models that we needed to put up there were guys that were pastoring freakishly large churches. All right. I'm great. Normally, historically l- large yes. churches. I mean, it's Praise God for those they're, churches. They're, they're, they're aberrations in history, though. They're the exception, not the rule. Right. And so I really think so um, in a fluke, <laughs> a mistake that the convention made a year ago, I was asked to preach at the pastor's conference. And so when I got up there, I said, you know, I pastor Linwood Baptist Church. And uh, I said, we could put the entire town inside this convention hall. I don't mean the population of the town. That's just 400. I mean, I could put the entire town from one end of Main Street to the other, the school, the bar, the Dollar General, the church, everything would fit inside this building. And of course, the whole place just kind of erupted over that. All of a sudden, people were like, oh, he gets us. And it's like, yeah, that's who we all are. You know, we're not a convention. We're not a nation of churches of over a thousand. We're a nation of churches. Like you said, the median size is 65. And trust me, God knows what he's doing. And if he puts that many normative sized churches out there all across North America, he wants to do something very special in those churches. And we have to quit trying to become big churches and start being the churches God wants us to be in the place that he has planted us. This is an attitudinal shift. And Mark Clifton does this better than anyone. And I I mean it, Mark. You are helping us understand the mindset is one of the major things we have to move from. We're going to talk about actions later, but we have to get to that mindset. And you're addressing it beautifully. So we're going to continue on. What's, What's another attitude? One, we got to resist the attitude that smaller churches or whatever these churches have insufficient resources. And the the typical one is we don't have the children's ministry. We don't have the student ministry. And so they're going to go all to the big church uh, two miles down the road. Yeah, probably the uh, evangelical committed family who homeschool their kids and move in your neighborhood, probably not going to come to your church. Now, they may, but I tell guys that all the time when I'm out there. You know, there there's a limited number of churches they can visit. Right? There's only 52 Sundays in a year. And they're going to start with the larger churches normally and start with those and visit those first. And when they visit those larger churches, they're going to be really impressed with all the stuff that church can provide for them and their family. And they're probably never going to make it to see your church. Now, they may live in your neighborhood. They may they may stop by and visit you. But I just say just don't expect to get the converted, strong Christian people that live in your community to be part of your church. Rather, Mm -hmm. your job and my job is to reach those who don't know Jesus who don't care for the church, who maybe are opposed to the church. That's our mission field. And Tom, they don't have, they don't care what your children's ministry is like. They, they, I mean, you got to be safe and take care of your children. I don't mean it that way, but they're not going to compare your children's ministry to the mega church in town. They don't even know what children's ministry is. Right. And even at Linwood, where I am now, we have about 40, 50 on Sunday morning. We do have Sunday school. Now we started that a few, few months ago. So we have children's Sunday school, but during worship, uh, and up until we, we we replanted it three years ago. So for two years, we had no Sunday school for children and nothing going on in worship for children. So what do we do? Well, we have a little bag and in the bag is on hooks. There's some little activities for kids that usually go along with the sermon. Sometimes they don't, but we try to make that work. And if if and so when the parents come or the grandparents that bring their kids, they just pick up the bag and the little kid takes it in the sanctuary and says what their parents or grandparents. And if they get distracted. There's some little activities they can do during worship. Uh, it really bothers me when the dad starts doing that during worship. That's another, <laughs> another day. But, you know, actually what's out. happened is, now listen to me. This is important. Everybody tune I'm, in. I'm listening. What, what's I'm happened listening, is over the two or three years, now the kids usually don't even take the bags. They just sit there with their parents. And wow. When you see a four or five-year-old set in church, I'm not sure. he Obviously, he doesn't understand everything, but he does understand this. Check this out. He understands his parents are worshiping. His parents are are, are experiencing something very unique in their life this week. He gets to see his parents worship. That will always be imprinted on that child's mind. Don't ever Mm. underestimate the power of that. You don't, it's not about entertaining the kid for an hour and a half. So he likes it. It's really about is how's the Holy spirit already working on the heart of that young child. 
and you can do some things in a we, last night Wednesday night. I, this is this, we're doing this on Friday, I guess. So it was a Thursday, Wednesday night. Went to went to our Wednesday night service. We we feed the community a free meal, and one of my one of my deacons leads the Bible study. We had about fifteen or eighteen there. Had five children there. Okay, wow. You know, I, a couple of them weren't members' kids. The others were. But, I, you know, I kind of leaned over to my wife and I'm thinking, man, we need to do something for these kids. And then I looked and when they were done eating, they sat by their parents or their grandparents and they were there in Bible study. I mean, there's you need to have times of age graded Bible study sure. for children. I get that. But, man, something that doesn't happen very often in a really large church where you see multi-generations, you see nine-year-olds sitting next to 40-year-olds next to a 90-year-old, which I can see in my church every Sunday morning. And I, I just think we need to run to those strengths. I love that, it. That was I a longer it. answer than you. I, I don't, I never have expectations for your answers, Mark. I just, I just, I just let it roll. I mean, oh, that one took seven minutes. Oh, that one took three. It's just, there, there, there is no structure here. Uh, Finally, <laughs> resist the attitude of comparison. We've said that in different ways today, but resist comparing to others. Your church is there because God put your church there. He put your church at your address for a reason. You're not better or worse than any other church of any other size because it's in another place or it's larger. Stop the comparison game. Agreed? Totally agreed. You cannot do that. It, there's That's... Listen, now this is this is worth tuning in the podcast for. Whenever you can want to compare yourself to another church, I don't think the Holy Spirit put that thought in your mind. Mm. Because either it's either it's going to lead to pride. Oh, look, you know, we're a lot better than they are. Or it's going to lead to envy. Man, if I had what they had, I could be so much better. And neither one of those things the Holy Spirit puts in your mind. Uh, I think what you want to do is you want to look to Jesus, not look to other churches. Uh, Jesus has a plan for your church. Find out what his plan is. It's not the plan down the street. It's not the plan from somebody in another town. It's unique to you. He, Jesus does not have one size fits all. Every church is unique. Find out what his plan is for you and embrace that plan. That is your plan just for you. Do not compare yourself to somebody else. And we live in a, you know, our denomination was a programmatic denomination, not as much as it used to be, but man, that was strongly in our DNA. And so mm-hmm. everybody used the same program. So we compared one another. How, how big is that program in your church? How big is that program in my church? And here's the reality. Only eternity is going to really display the results of your labor. You're never going to know this side of eternity, what you have accomplished. Uh, but God will use every prayer you pray, every Bible study you lead, every sermon you prepare, every funeral you preach, Every counseling session you have, he none of that, my, the Bible says, none of that goes out and comes back void. He will use all of that for his glory and for the gospel. When we get to heaven, you're going to look back and you're going to be able to see. It's going to be, we're going to have all this time to just see all that God has done that we never saw when we were here. And uh, so don't, don't, don't waste what's going on right now. Realize none of it's wasted. That's why Paul said, don't grow weary in well-doing. And if you compare yourself to other people, you will grow weary incredibly quickly. But when you just are confident that you're doing what God wants you to do and you'll let him take care of those results, and, and there'll be results you could never have imagined uh, when you get to heaven and see that. That is a good period to put on a great podcast. Mark, you reflect the attitudes as well as anyone I know. And uh, I, this 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 particular these this attitudinal shift action shifts about the small church, I think this is going to go into the Mark Clifton classics. It is really really good stuff. Hey, by the way, if you want to come back for the Mark Clifton classics on revitalize and replant, we'll continue this discussion in part two. We've been talking about attitudes of the small church. Now we're going to talk about some action shifts. So stay tuned. And if you just listen to this on the release date, we'll see you in a week. If you're listening to it later, you can probably download it even now. So thank you for being here. Give us a rating and review. And also go watch us on YouTube because you get to see our lovely faces. We'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>